Well, welcome everyone once again uh, to this uh, study. Today is uh, Sabbath, January 15th, 2021, uh, 2022. It's going to take a while to get used to that. And today we're continuing in our study of the new humanity. And uh, I, I believe that I can finish the study today. I'd like to. That's my intention. So it's possible that we might go, uh, we might go till around five o'clock today, just a little under two hours instead of the normal 90 minutes, because I'd like to get through this material and, and start fresh on something else next week, if I'm willing. So um, without further ado, uh, I'm not going to go into a long recap today, except to say that we've already begun the section, the final section on Yashua and the new humanity. So we've come from the cosmic view, the, out, the outer view of all of humanity, bringing it into the Israel view, the Israel story, the cosmic story, bringing it into the Israel story, and now we're finally tying in, tying it in into the Yahshua story. Yahshua, who represents the true human, the new human, right? The son of man. And because of the son of man, we are able to, uh, we are able to come before the presence of Yahweh with hope, because as we'll see today, re reinforced in a more powerful way, as we'll see today, uh, Almighty Yahweh has uh, has done through Yahshua the Messiah what uh, what was not done through uh, Adam or through all of the various members of Israel. Although there were great people in that mix, they did not fulfill what Yahshua alone could fulfill. And because of Yahshua, he uh, the the curse on humanity has been reversed, and we can now have a glorious future in him because of what Yahshua has done. So without further ado, uh, let's go straight into the remaining material today. And what we'll do is we'll start by going straight to the text over in, uh, in the, uh, the Bible project material. So you should see that coming on your screen momentarily. And we're on page, if you're following along in your own notes and you can just watch it on screen, um, we're on page 75. So I left it last time with Yahshua having a victory over death. Uh, and uh, through, through his death and uh, on the cross and resurrection. And the last point there, Yahshua's resurrection, this is point seven on page uh, 74. Excuse me, page 75. Uh, point seven, Yahshua's resurrection is portrayed as his vindication from death and the way that he received eternal authority over all of heaven and earth. And that you see reflected in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Yahshua came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So this business about authority having been given to me in heaven and on earth, this is as a result of his, his, his death and resurrection. So Yahshua is here, A, he's here claiming to be the vindicated son of man. This is, this is Daniel language, right? The figure from Daniel 7, 12 through 14, and Psalm 8. Psalm 8 is the... Uh, the psalm that starts uh, Yahweh, our sovereign, how, um, uh, oh my goodness, all of a sudden I'm, I'm blanking on the verse, um, how majestic is your name in all, in all the earth, right? Uh, this is the one that, that glorifies Yahweh. It's, it begins and ends in the same way, and it, it speaks about mankind's vocation, mankind's destiny as co-ruler with Yahweh on this earth. Oh, Yahweh, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth, okay? And, um, and it describes throughout the psalm, it describes the works of the heavens and uh, what is man that you think of him, the son of man, that you are concerned about him. And this is, again, language reflecting what you see in the book of Daniel. So Yahshua is claiming here to be the one who has received all that authority, as, in, as, as is described in Daniel 7, who is installed as the 
uh, as you could tell, I don't, I'm not crazy about the word divine for certain reasons. So who is installed as the eternal slash human ruler over all of heaven and earth. And then B, the risen Yahshua is the new humanity. And we're going to see more of that in the, the letters of the Apostle Paul. So, you know, sometimes you'll see that scholars will, um, will claim that Paul developed a different, let me uh, just go straight here away from the notes for a minute. People will claim that, uh, that Yahshua, uh, excuse me, that Paul, the apostle, did not, um, that he kind of developed his own version of who Yahshua was uh, and um, and it was it was very different than who Yahshua thought he was and who the apostles thought he was and, uh, and 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 that's a bunch of nonsense. That's not that's just not true at all. As a matter of fact, matter of fact, I'd argue the opposite. Right? That when when you look at the record of the writings of the New Testament as we know them, okay. So in our English versions of today, you have roughly twenty seven uh, books of the New Testament, of which thirteen are writings uh, are, are epistles. And uh, when you look at the, at the writings of the New Testament, particularly the Gospels, the Book of Acts, and, and the writings of, of Paul, the, um, the earliest known writings, the earliest known Messianic writings are, in fact, the epistles of Paul. And, and in particular, the Book of Galatians, there seems to be general consensus that the Book of Galatians was probably the first one written and if, if I'm not mistaken, right around 53 common era or something of that nature. So, so you would think that if, if there was a later development, you know, by the apostle Paul, that the, the writings of the old test, the writings of the, of the gospels would be so different in their conceptual, in, in, their, in their concepts than what, what are in the apostle Paul, uh, Paul's writings. And they're not, you know, and, and Paul, uh, so did Paul set the pace if he wrote the earliest things and then he had something completely different and then the Gospels had something completely different that and didn't follow Paul? It's just it's this nonsensical. And and as we look at the writings, there's no there's no there's no there's no contradiction between anything that Paul wrote and 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 the things that were written, for example, in the Gospels. So they're very they're, they're actually quite consistent. And I think that one of the reasons, personally, my feeling is that one of the reasons that folks don't understand what the apostle Paul, how he expressed things was because he expressed things as a lawyer. He was a, he was a Pharisee, which means he was a, a, a lawyer, you know, of the Torah. And he had a certain arguing style, you know, a certain style of debate, which was very common among the Pharisees. And it was very logical. It was very meticulous and it was very profound and philosophical in nature. So the way that he presented things sometimes were, as Paul, as the Apostle Peter said, were there are things that are somewhat hard to understand, and you know that, that the ignorant and the unlearned rests, they twist to their own detriment from the from the Apostle Paul, from my brother Paul. But also, much I, I think that even on a, on a deeper level, I believe that the reason that so many misunderstand the difference between what Paul said about Yahshua and what the let's say the gospel said about Yahshua is because they they're interpreting things through through the the lens of Gentiles and not through the lens of first century Judaism, which is what what Paul was raised in and what all these people were raised in. So when you look at the at the life setting, you know what's called the Sitzim Laban. When you know when you look at the life setting and when you look at the um What's the term I'm looking for? When you look at the life setting, and when uh, and when you look at the oh, the term escapes me, but when you look at the prism at which the world the world view I think is the term I'm looking for. When you look at the world view that Paul and and the apostles had, it was a world view that was based in in first century Judaism. It wasn't a Gentile lens. So when you compare all these stories, the cosmic story, the Israel story the Yashra story, you have to view those as a continuum. And because people tend to view the Apostle Paul's, uh, the Apostle Paul as a Gentile apostle, he wasn't a Gentile apostle, he was an apostle to the Gentiles, which is very quite a different thing. So people want to make Paul into a Gentile, thinking like a Gentile, and therefore they're interpreting his writings through the lens of how a Gentile might have interpreted things, and nothing can be further from the truth. So when you understand 
that he's taking things directly from the cosmic story with with no with, with seamlessly going into the Israel story and eventually making its way into the Asher story, then it all makes sense because it's like, you know, it's 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 all part and parcel to one of the other. So when he talked to believers, he talked to believers and non-believers, but most of his writings were actually, when you look at Paul's writings, most of his writings were actually to believers in Yahshua. So there was a lot of there were a lot of things that Paul took for granted that his readers already knew. So he wasn't going to explain every last detail about Judaism and what this meant and what that meant from the Torah and what this meant from the prophets, etc. Because he he would say something and then he it was his understanding that everyone who's listening to him for the most part is following what he's saying because this is part of the story. It's the cosmic story, the Israel story, and the Yasha story, and it's all interwoven. So when he says something about that smacks of the Shema, he doesn't go into any kind of great detail explaining it any further because they know what the Shema is. It was evident to them. So he didn't have to go into all that detail. So anyway, keep that in mind, not just for the study today, but any time that you're looking at the writings of Paul, and when people start going in all sorts of weird directions and you know, talk, start talking about the Christology of Paul and this and that, just... Just take all that with a grain of salt and understand that that's the result of, you know, of, 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 of literally centuries of, of writings viewing Paul through the eyes of, of, of a Gentile apostle and not through the eyes of a Jewish apostle. Okay, And it really is that simple, in my opinion. So let's take a look. Let's take a closer look. And we'll start. Uh, I'll bring the notes back up. Uh, and you should see page 75. So Yahshua as the new humanity in Paul the Apostle's letters. So one, Paul regularly refers to Yahshua as the image of Elohim from Genesis 1 and to followers of Yahshua as the new humanity who are being transformed to become like there is in Yahshua. And, you know, of course, depending on the translation, it's going to be a little different. And we're going to see that. We'll compare translations so that you can, you can see that concept of the new humanity shining through. So I told you last week when we ended that we're going to take sort of a heavy look into the in, into the uh, the epistle to the Colossians. Um, won't give you a whole lot of background on this except to say that the letter to Colossae was part of a sort of a of, of a triad of uh, of assemblies in the in the local area where you had uh, Hierapolis. You had Colossae, and you also had Laodicea, right? So when you when you talk about the letter to, to the Laodiceans in the book of Revelation, that's a letter that probably was, was written to this whole group in this area here, right? Because they would have read one another's letters. And there may be a letter to Laodicea that we don't know about that has not survived. But, you know, there's a mention to a, a letter that was read to Laodicea, and it may have been the book of Ephesians. When you look at the, at, at the letter to the Colossians, Colossians and Ephesians have very similar text to them, okay? So, but anyway, uh, Colossae, they, they had certain, uh, it, there's a certain flavor to the, the letter to the Colossians, and we're not going to go through that whole letter, but I'm just going to read a few of these verses here. So when you look at Colossians 1, 13 to 16, it, this is when it describes Yahshua as the, the firstborn of all creation. So he says, for he rescued us, he, meaning um, Yahweh, the Father, right? For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So a, a large part of the kingdom is the concept of redemption and forgiveness, right? This is why Yahshua said that um, that, that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins, because forgiveness of sins is a, is a great part, a central part to, the, to the, the redemption of mankind, right? What does it mean to redeem? We throw terms around sometimes, and not, we're not really sure what they mean uh, in, in the deepest sense. Well, the term redeem means that you give something up for the sake of another, right? Or something up for the sake of another. So if you if you redeem uh, an animal, then you may you might pay a ransom for that animal, right? So the concept of redemption is bound up in paying the debt for something else. So in the case of humanity, you, humanity had fallen into the, the domain of darkness as as the letter of Colossians begins. And 
it is through Yahshua's redemption, right? Or our redemption through Yahshua that we are removed from the domain of darkness. It's no longer a domain of darkness for us. You know, with because of Adam's sin in the garden, we refer to that as the fall, right? And, and it's a, a fall from Yahweh's grace. It's exile from the garden. But then this redemption that, take, that took place through Yahshua, through the shedding of his blood, which allows us back into the garden. So an innocent died on our behalf to redeem us. And now we are able to go back into the presence of Yahweh. In other words, the removal of, ex of a condition of exile and restoring us, re us meaning humanity, restoring us to a position of honor and glory with Yahweh in the garden, right? So let me go back to um, the text. And then it describes this personage in, in detail. He, Yahshua, he is the image of the invisible Elohim. There it is. Who else? This idea of an image, it immediately brings to our mind Genesis 1, right? Where we are made in the image of Elohim. So it's significant where he describes, so when Paul is talking to the Colossians, right? If you're, if you're a Gentile who knows, who doesn't know the scriptures, oh yeah, maybe this is all new to you and you're wondering, well, what does all this have to do? Redemption, what does that mean? Even the concept of forgiveness, what exactly that, does that mean? What is, what is this image business? But to a Jew... To an Israelite, that's clear as day. Image, yes, the Garden of Eden. You see, he is the image of the invisible Elohim, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created. So he's, he's, he's telling you back to Genesis. He's bringing you back to Genesis. He's talking about creation. For by him, by Yahshua, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth. And this is an allusion to the uniting, the reuniting of heaven and earth, both in the heavens and on earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. In other words, everything on heaven and earth is subject to him. Well, what does that go back to? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, you see. All things have been created through him and for him. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross see this is this is ironic language right he made a public spectacle of them who who the, who he who them he made a public spectacle of them well the antecedent for these is and having disarmed he yashua having disarmed them the powers and authorities he made a public spectacle of them so he disarmed them and he made a public spectacle of them how and he and he, so if you were if you were writing this out, this is where the methodical Bible study uh, techniques really work when you sp spell these things out. If I were doing a sermon, I would say he, and then I put separately, disarmed the powers, uh, made a public spectacle of the powers, triumphed over the powers. And then I might make three separate sermon points showing how he disarmed them, how he uh, made a public spectacle of them, and how he triumphed over them. And that's my sermon right there. That's a, that's a sermon right there, right? So how did he do this? Well, he did this by the cross. In other words, the irony here is that the powers and authorities, and he, he just referred to them, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, as represented in Yahshua's day by Rome, right? The main power, but not exclusively. It was Rome, but also the Pharisees, the, the 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 scribes, right? The teacher, all the teachers of the law, all the ones, in other words, who were doing the Sadducees, all the ones who were doing Rome's bidding, all of those are the powers and authorities. All of those represent some version of what you see over in uh, in Daniel seven. So let's let's just take a quick look at Daniel seven, and I'll start reading with verse. Um, well, verse nine talks about the ancient of days takes a seat. Right, And then down in verse 13, I kept looking in the night visions, Daniel says, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given a dominion, or to, or, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And you know, you you also see um, 
a parallel to this, you know, for example, in Daniel, in Daniel chapter two, in the, the vision, uh, the, the dream of the book of Nazar, where he says to him about that final kingdom, he says, uh, starting with verse 43, uh, this is Daniel 2.43. And in that and in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay. They will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. In the days of those kings, the Allah, the Allah, the Allah of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will in itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the silver, the, the silver and the gold, the clay, the great Elohim has made known to the king what will take place in the future. Uh, and, um, and I'm thinking another, of another passage that is escaping me at the moment of how the, the people of Yahweh are going to be the ones who are going to reign, right? So, uh, and you might look at Daniel 12 at the very end there, and then he says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Right. So this is a final victory by the saints of Yahweh. So there, there are a number of passages, and there, there is also more that I just don't have time to get to. But uh, in terms of them... Right, it's more than just the powers of darkness and evil. Yeah, so it's so them is referring in every age to the powers and authorities, but it's really the power behind the throne as well. Right, it's it's the it's the the evil forces that are motivating the the kings and the rulers and the governors and the presidents, etc. I don't mean to imply that every single president, and governor, etc., is, is 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 motivated by evil. That's not my intent. What I'm saying is that. The, the whether there there's a ruler who is motivated by you know scripture or there's a ruler who's motivated by the adversary there these powers are represented behind the scenes it's again a term referred to as the power behind the throne it's it's also similar to what you see uh, it's also described over in ephesians 5 right uh, ephesians 6 uh, where it says where it's talking about the armor of Elohim, and is talking about our struggle in verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness. Remember, the language in Ephesians and Colossians are very similar, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So, so the them that's, that Paul's referring to is the worldly authorities and the, the powers behind those authorities. And Yahshua has authority over all of them. This is Daniel's seven language. He's been given authority over all of them. Okay. So let me go back to the, the text here. So he, and, and how did he disarm them? Through the cross, right? He made a public spectacle of them. And I was, I was about to say that the, 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 the irony is that the powers put him on the cross, right? They, they, they were making, it, it was their intent to make a public spectacle of him. And he turned the tables around. So Paul is being sort of, sort of cute here, right? He's saying, "Look, they they meant to put the they meant to put him to make a public spectacle of him, like they always do with people on the cross." But you know what? He flipped it upside his head, and he made them a public spectacle instead through the cross. You see, because the 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 the, the jokes on them, because the last the last laugh, he's having it in victory. You see. Colossians 3, verse 9, and this is on the right-hand side. And this language is going to be, uh, by, by the writers of the Bible Project, it's, it's being presented in the terminology of old humanity versus new humanity, right? But we've seen it as the new man, the old man, same thing. Do not lie to one another, since you put aside the old humanity with its evil practices and have put on the new humanity, who is being renewed to a true knowledge, According to the image of the one, there's the concept of the image again, right? Who is being renewed, to, who is being renewed, or what is being renewed? Maybe you better have put on the new humanity that is being renewed, because this all of humanity, you see. New humanity that is being renewed to a true knowledge, 
according to the image of the one who created them, who created him. A renewal in which there's no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and freeman, but the Messiah is all and in all. So let me just show that in, uh, in a version that's more, uh, more common. I'm not sure what translation that is, if that's Tim Mackey's own translation or, uh, but let's, uh, let's take a look at it in, let's say the NE at NASB, which is what I've been using lately. Three verse nine. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old, the old self with its evil practices, right? So it's identified as self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. But see, this is why I agree with Mackey's translation of humanity and not this self. You see how this, how, how, how translations can be misleading? Because when you look at this, do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self. It makes it look like it's just talking about the individual. It's not. You're part of it, yeah. But you are representative of the whole humanity. You're one of the whole. Why do I say that? Because he's, he's put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of one who created him, a renewal in which there's no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised. This is broader than just you and me, my friends. This is, this is all of humanity. There's a grand scheme that's being ironed out here. When you look at the word here for self, take a look at the lower left. What is the word? Anthropos, right? It's, it's the word for where we get, uh, it, it's the, the Greek word for where we get the word anthropology, which is what? Which is the study of you personally? No. Anthropology is the study of what? Anybody know? If you just drop it in the chat, if you know. What is, what is anthropology? Nobody? Yeah, the study of humanity, the study of mankind. It's where they start looking at the cavemen and all that and where man came from and evolution and all that. Anthropology, right? And in, in their thinking, of course, right? So anthropology, that's where the word comes from. Anthropos, it means man. It means it's, it's, it's humanity. It's not just the self. That's a very limited vision. It's all of humanity. Uh, I'm just curious to see. I don't want to make too big a deal of this because you get the point. But I want to see if, if any of the other translations bear that out. I'm just curious, the New Living Translation. Yeah, see, put on your new, your new, uh, see, uh, you have stripped off your, see, I don't like that. You stripped off your old sinful nature. That's not, that's not an accurate translation. I mean, you could make an argument for that too, but that's not, that's not accurate. This is the NRSV. They use self. Uh, what does the NIV do? I'm curious. They use self also. Okay, look, by the way, look at the definition down below. Man, human, right? It's not, this is not just the self. That's not a, that's not a good translation. Yeah, everyone, everyone favors the term self. And that's not, that's not the best translation here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so self is, is the, the, uh, the common one. But in any case, we're talking about here a new, the broad scheme of a new humanity that is being renewed because of Yahshua's sacrifice. Okay, so if you say self in the sense of I'm part of that overall humanity, good and well, but it's not limiting itself just to the, the individual self. Okay, so let me go back to the, the text and we'll continue. So you put aside the old self, the old humanity with his evil practices, and you put on the new humanity who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. And he, dis, he, he makes clear, broadly, a renewal in which no Greek and Jew, no circumcised and uncircumcised. This was Paul's ministry, right? This was Paul's ministry, where he was trying to show that the new humanity, the fullness of that humanity, is not divided between Greek and Jew and, and, and Greek representing all kinds of foreign, anything that's not a Jew, right? And circumcised, not circumcised. This was the whole point of the book of Galatians, where what Yahweh is creating in terms of community is humanity. 
is the entirety of humanity. It's the Tower of Babel. It's Babylon reversed. It's the curse of humanity reversed. It's unification of humanity under the banner of, Yah of Yahshua Messiah because of his redemption, because of his blood, you see. Okay, so uh, let's move on from there. Notice that in these passages, uh, Yahshua is the truly human. Am I sharing that? Make sure it's coming up. Okay. Yahshua is the truly human image of Elohim who has defeated the spiritual powers of darkness in his death and resurrection. And because of that, that's why the new humanity can survive. In Colossians 1, 13 to 15, Paul uses the language of firstborn and kingdom of the son. And we saw that and when we read it. Recall Psalm 89 discussed above, which is a messianic psalm, and the image of Elohim from Genesis 1, which I mentioned. He also draws upon the imagery of Daniel 7 in Colossians 2.15, which I described, describing Yahshua's death as his victory over the powers of evil. Here, Paul is combining the ideas of Genesis 3.15 with the gospel announcement of Yahshua's resurrection. resurrection. What's Genesis 3.15? That's the promise that the one who is to come would crush Satan under his feet. So you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. Remember that? In Colossians 3, Paul, which is the whole discussion I just had, Paul about new humanity, Paul then extends Yahshua's new humanity to include those who trust in Yahshua and give their allegiance to him. They will find themselves being transformed into the new kind of humanity that Yahshua pioneered on our behalf. Okay. And by the way, you, you also see that described in Ephesians 4, where it talks about putting off the old man and putting on the new man, right? The resurrection of the new humanity. One, and we've gone through this several times, so I, I think I'm going to go through this a little bit faster than usual, but I do want to go through it. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul offers his most developed thoughts on the nature of Yahshua's resurrection and how it provides a solution to the problems created in Genesis 1 to 3. What are the problems described in Genesis 1 to 3? Well, the fall, right? And the fact that man was supposed to live forever, and instead he brought a death sentence upon himself, and Yahweh exiled him from the garden so that he would not partake of the tree of, of life. A, Paul presents Yahshua as a new Adam. And remember, in Hebrew, the word Adam is the word for humanity. It was humanity's rebellion leading to death that prevented humans from being Yahweh's eternal partners who could rule over heaven and earth. So let's read this section of, because they usually, he usually get, bases these notes based on, on the, the verses that he puts here. So this is 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 27, his translation here. But the Messiah has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And we go over this every year during the Passover season when we talk about the way sheaf, the Omer. For since death came through a human, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a human. For as in Adam all die, so in Messiah all will be made alive. But each in turn, Messiah the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. You might recall that in, in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 12, he talks about everyone standing in their lot. You know, he says, Daniel, go to sleep, right? Go, you know, you, you know you're going to die and you'll be raised in, in time in your lot. Each, there's a, there's, a, there's a time for everyone to be raised, uh, and it's a specific order. You also see that being described in First Thessalonians 4, when it describes Yahshua's return. There's an order in which people are raised. For as in Adam all die, so in Messiah all will be, be made alive, but each in turn. Messiah the first fruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him, like in First Thessalonians 4. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to, to Elohim the Father after he has destroyed, there it is again, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. So notice, dominion, authority, and power continues. Is that logical? Yes, because we see it today, right? We see it right in front of our very faces, right in front of our noses. You know, human beings haven't stopped ruling and reigning and making bad decisions. We're, we're suffering the effects of it all the time. Why? Because we're in that... We're in that gap period between Yahshua's ascension and Yahshua's fully, you know, full taking in of his kingdom. 
we're in that in that period in between where the gospel is being announced, where the king is being announced. So there's that op there's oh, that open period in which there is still the powers of darkness, the dominion, authority, and power still working their mischief because all of his enemies are being put under his feet in the course of history. Because, you know, in, in Yahweh's timetable, it's like a, bucket, a drop in a bucket. For us, it seems like an eternity, right? But for him, it's a drop in a bucket. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet, including death, in other words. So 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to, to 27 says that. So moving to the left here. So uh, Paul presents Yahshua as a new Adam. And remember, and we're going to see that a little bit more fully, but he says here, for us in Adam, all die. So in Messiah, all will be made alive. Adam, Adam, first Adam, second Adam. It was humanity's rebellion leading to death that prevented humans from being Yahweh's eternal partners who could rule over heaven and earth. B, this is precisely the problem that the resurrection of Yahshua solves. It opens up the way for a new humanity that does not die to be Elohim's covenant partners in ruling creation. Yahshua is presently the only new human who exists in this resurrected new creation state. And that's exactly right. But he's the first, Messiah, the first fruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him. That's how it's going to work. Right. So you want to see this another place? I've shown it to you before. Let's go there. Uh, it's not here in the notes here, as far as I can tell, but we'll we'll take a look at that. And that's Second Corinthians 5. For we know, 2 Corinthians 5.1, Paul speaking to the Corinthians. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down. What does he mean? He means this. Our earthly tent, which is our house. He's speaking in metaphor, figuratively. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from Yahweh, right? So we have this, this tent, which is, if you look at the, the lower left there, skenos. It's a tent. If we have that tent that comes down, that's okay because we have an oikodome. 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 oikodome a, ha, a building. So you have a tent and you have a building. Which is better, the tent or the building? Clearly the building, which is more permanent, right? The tent is flimsy. The tent is tabernacle stuff, temporary. But the building... It's eternal, yes? So we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from Elohim. So in other words, don't despair. Yeah, we have the tent, and we're going to lose the tent. But we have the building coming. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. In other words, the source is from the heavens. For indeed, in this house, in this house, we groan. And notice, by the way, that the word house here, is, is not the same as the word house here, it's not even, because it's not even in the text. You see, it's, it's, it's italicized, which means that it doesn't, this is why you, you got to look at different translations because they can be misleading. So you look at this in an, any English translation, you think, oh, they're talking about the same thing. A house, or indeed in this house, we groan. Wait, you just said that this house is eternal. Why would we groan in the house? Because he's not talking about the house that proceeds from Elohim. He's talking about the tent, right? So, you know, it's, it's poor translation. Look at me, the, 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 the guy who's, you know, not even a Greek scholar. And, and, but but it, there's no logical sense to that translation. He's not talking about the house. He's talking about the tent. For indeed, in this house, he might as well said, for in, indeed, in this tent, we groan. Because that would have been more consistent with the text. So read carefully, right? For, so this is not even there. So what it actually says in the Greek is, for indeed, in this, we groan. There's no word there. In this we groan. And what, so what it means is that, yeah, the italicized word is not in the original text. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interpreter's word or term put in there to try to explain the text. But he's, he's talking about the tent. For indeed, in this we groan, in the tent, longing to be clothed with our dwelling. In other words, longing to be clothed with the building. In other words, we want the mortal. The building that he's referring to is the, the body that of the new humanity. That's what I'm getting at. It's the glorified body. We're, we're longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, which is the glorified body. In as much as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. We'll never be naked again. To be naked is to be vulnerable. 
Adam and Eve. And what is this naked? This is this is allusion to the Garden of Eden, right? Will not be found naked. When Yahweh confronted Adam and Eve in the garden, they said to him, he said, where are you, Adam? Aphel. And he says, uh, he says, he says, we were naked, we were naked and we hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Right. But we're not going to do so. They were found naked, but we'll never be found naked again. We will never be vulnerable because of sin again, because we'll put on that glorified body having been redeemed. Right. For indeed, while we are in this tent. So now we have the word skenos again, which is actually in the text. We groan, which is what was happening in verse two, right? For indeed, while we were in this tent, we groan being burdened because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed so that what is mortal, this skenos, this tent will be swallowed up by life and that glorified body as represented by that glorified body, which is a body of life. Keep that in mind because we're going to see more of that a little bit later when we see that we have a body animated by the spirit. We'll come back to that. Now, he who prepared us for this very purpose is Yahweh, who gave to us the spirit as a pledge. And this is Ephesians 1 language. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the master, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Okay. And there's stuff going on here I can't explain. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body than to be at home with the master. So this is this is Philippians 1 language where, where Peter, uh, Peter, Paul was uh, saying, you know, I don't know which is better, to stay or to go, right? It's a similar sentiment. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. So whether, you know, whether we live or, or eventually die, we want to be well pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Messiah, so that each one may be recompensed for the deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And then he goes on speaking from there. And then down a little bit further below, he says in verse 16, therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. In other words, we see things differently because of Yahshua now. Even though we have known Messiah according to the flesh, we knew him according, we, we thought about him a certain way before we really knew who he was. But now we know him in this way no longer. Now we know him the way he actually is because we saw what happened to him. Therefore, so we have, a, we have a record, a testimony of what happened to him. Therefore, if anyone is in Messiah, new creation. He's a new creature. The old things passed away. The old humanity has passed away. Behold, new things have come. This is what it says in the book of Revelation too. Behold, I make all things new. Now all these things are from Elohim who reconciled us to himself through Messiah. That's the redemption through Messiah and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that Yahweh was in Messiah reconciling the world to himself. So he's, the Yahshua story is rippling outward through the Israel story, through, through the, through, through the, eventually to the cosmic story. Do you see that? It's like, it's like the, every movie that you see where there's, where there's a final redemption, this is the story, right? It's all, it's, it all points you to the biblical story, whether they realize it or not, whether the filmmakers know it or not. Right, Simba walking up the walking up the thing to his to his the, the crag to his top thing. That's that's the Messiah walking up to his throne. They don't know that, but we know that, right? And pick a half dozen movies at random, right? The, the Star Wars movies, pick one from any from any decade, and I guarantee you that it's the Bible story. In, in, in because there's nothing new under the sun and they're just telling and retelling it over and over again. And this is what's happening here with humanity as well. Everything ripples, the ripple effects go out all the way to the cosmic story, you understand. And that Elohim, verse 19, was in Messiah reconciling the world to himself. What is that? That is re redeeming mankind. That's Colossians 1. That's, that's finally the second Adam restoring creation to what they were supposed to be, not counting the trespasses against them. What's that? Forgiveness. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Forgiveness, unification, reconciliation. It's all there. And then it describes how we're supposed to be doing the same thing. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Messiah, doing the same thing to the world, doing Yashua's as his hands and his feet and his voice in this world, ruling with him, 
starting to announce to people, there's a new king and you need to get with the program. We are ambassadors of Messiah as though Elohim were making an appeal through us. Yes. He's making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Messiah, be reconciled to Elohim. Change your life. Be reconciled to Yahweh. Stop living the way this world wants you to live because they don't have it straight. He made him who knew no sin and innocent, Yahshua, to be sin on our behalf. In other words, to be accursed and hang on a tree so that we might become the righteousness of Yahweh in him. You see how that works? So in the same way that he uh, was effecting the ministry of reconciliation, we carry on his work effecting the ministry of reconciliation to this world so that they also can be part of, you, of the new humanity. It's a restoration that's, being, that's occurring. That's why as dark as everything gets, my friends, that is our destiny. Even now, our destiny is light, is to push through this period of darkness understanding fully that no matter how dark it gets in this present age, we already have the victory and we're ambassadors reconciling the world to Yahweh. That's what we're doing. Doesn't seem that way some days, right? But that's exactly what we're doing. And that's what I'd always like you to keep in mind. So let's go back to 76, page 76. Notice, see, that Paul quotes from Psalm 8, 6 in the final line above, showing that he equates Yahshua with the new humanity. So what's Psalm uh, 8, verse 6? Let me just take a quick look at that. Okay, so I won't turn to it, but you can hear me. Uh, you make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. That's it. Put all things under his feet. Okay, let's go back to the text. Two, the climax of Paul's argument in this chapter, what chapter? 1 Corinthians 15, is an exploration of the new creation humanity whose prototype is the risen Yahshua. So I gave you 2 Corinthians 5, which describes that, that new building, which is, which is being described almost as, as a, a building over the tent. You know, I, I, know, I know one person uh, that I used to be you know, fairly close with, that he, he, had, a, he had a trailer. It's not exactly a tent, but he had a trailer and that he wanted to building his property. You know, he had his trailer on his property and right on his property, he, he and his family lived in that trailer. And for months or years, he built around that trailer until he had his entire house around that trailer. And then the trailer just kind of stripped away and what was left was the house. It's sort of what we're talking about here, right? In a metaf metaphorical way. So we have the tent and the tent is kind of being swallowed up in victory. So the climax of Paul's argument is an exploration of the new creation. And that's where he describes how the resurrection is, right? So, but someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? You fool. And the reason he's speaking that way undoubtedly is because you had people who were trying to tear down this doctrine of the resurrection. So he's being, um, he's being ironic here in, in his description, uh, because, uh, Maybe ironic's not the right word, but he's being he's he's being a little sassy here, right? Uh, speaking to the, the naysayers, he said, "You fool! That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies, and that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain." In other words, he's saying you think you know so much, you don't even you don't even know how basic nature works. That when you sow, you know when you sow, and I'm not a farmer, so if I say something out of turn, <laughs> please understand my intent. When you sow a seed for I don't know tomatoes, right? Yeah, you don't you don't you don't have a seed that looks like a tomato, right? That much I know. Okay. The seed doesn't look like a like a little mini tomato. The seed is a little tiny thing, and you put it in the ground, and then you come up with a what is it? A seed, a, 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 a tomato plant, I guess, right? A vine, I guess, for tomatoes. You know, if you whatever it is that you whatever it is that you plant, it doesn't look like that. Right? You don't you don't take a little mini, a little mini carrot and well, maybe carrot's a bad idea, right? Because I think it's a root that you can actually put in. But you don't, do you take, um, oh, I don't know, uh, the mustard seed that Yasha talks about? You don't take a mustard plant and shove it into the ground. You take a mustard seed, which is about this tiny, and then it grows into something huge with giant leaves, right? So he's saying that if that's the way that that is, why is that going to be any different for our new bodies? You do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or something. Oh, I could have just looked there and seen the wheat, right? You just take, you know, perhaps of wheat or something else. 
but Yahweh gives it a body just as he wished, and to each of the seeds a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh. And then he talks about, I won't read through all this, but, you know, fish have one, they look one way, and beasts, you know, animals, cows look another way, and even extends to the heavenly bodies. All the planets don't look the same, right? Stars are gaseous balls of fire, and then you have planets that, you know, in include, you know, metal and, and rock and all that. All the bodies are different. And so it is with our human bodies. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a corruptible body, a tent. It is raised an imperishable body, the building. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spirit-empowered body. And I like the way that he put that there, a spirit-empowered body. We're going to come back to that. If there is a natural body, there is also a spirit-empowered body. That's exactly right in that translation. This must be his own translation. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not the first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first human is from the earth of dust, that's Adam. In fact, that's what his name refers to, Adama, dust, earth, you know, the, the dirt, the ground, terra. Right? The second human is from heaven, so he's, he's, his source is from heaven, as is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy, and as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Bit of a poor translation, but the idea is that you have a physical body, right, and then you have a body, and that body is animated by, by a certain type of spirit, and then you have the body that is a, 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 a glorified body, because as is the heavenly, the heavenly, not the heavenly in the sense that he's an ethereal disembodied corpse, right? A disembodied spirit, not corpse, but disembodied spirit, because that's not how Yahshua is described at all. So we're saying, it's saying we're going to be like the heavenly, in other words, the heavenly personage who is Yahshua, who proceeds from heaven, right? It's not talking about, again, that we're going to be in heaven. It's talking about that we're going to be like the one who is from heaven. And how is the one who is from heaven? Well, let's take a look at it. We don't, have, we don't have to guess. We have that kind of language. So if you go to John 20, he's there among them. Yahshua came and stood in their midst, John 20, verse 19, and said to them, peace be with you. Shalom Aleichem. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. And the disciples rejoiced. And then Thomas comes in verse 24. He says, unless I see, in verse 25, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. So verse 26, 27, then he said to Thomas, he, come, you know, he returns after eight days. He said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here your hand and put it in my side. Means he could touch him. He could feel it. Or you might look at Matthew 28, verse 9, well, 28 for context. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy, with fear and great joy, mixture of emotions, and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Yahshua met them and greeted them. And they came up and did what? They came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. I'm sorry, folks, in, in no universe do you take hold of someone's feet if they're spirit, a, a disembodied spirit. Yahshua not, was not walking around a spirit. He was walking about with some type of body, right, that could be physically touched. What about Luke 24? While they were telling these things, verse 36, he himself stood in their midst and said to them, peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. Excuse me? A spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have? And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still not, could, not, could not believe it because of the joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? Was it just because he's hungry? No, he wants to prove to them, right? I can eat with you. They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. You can't verbally, you know, use verbal acrobatics, acrobatics to explain that away. He ate with them, right? So 
what does that mean? That we're all going to be eating also? I don't know. But he did say, I'm going to eat with you in the kingdom, right? Didn't he say that about the Passover meal? Hey, I'm going to share it with you again. So, you know, so he, 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 but yet you could see other places where he appears and reappears and disappears and reappears rather seemingly as if he can go through walls, right? So there's something different about this body and they don't even recognize him quite. So it's not exactly the same body that he had when he died, but it's very similar and it has very similar characteristics. So this is what we're talking about, a glorified body that's a spirit body that works differently, you see, and it's imperishable. So the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last became a living spirit. The first human is from the earth of dust. The second human is from heaven, as is the earthy. In other words, as is the one whose origin is the earth, so also are those who are earthy. So while we're in this mortal flesh, we're just like Adam who came from the ground, right? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, that kind of thing. And as is the heavenly, in other words, the heavenly has a glorified body. It's not a spirit body. So also are those who are heavenly. So when we are changed, when we are transformed, that is how we're going to look as well. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy in this present flesh, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. We're going to be just like him in our spirit bodies. This is an extremely dense paragraph in our English vocabulary, uh, physical. And okay, so here's where it starts to get kind of fun. So just stay with me. Um, so I don't, so I don't, uh, I don't lose you. Okay. And uh, our English vocabulary, physical and spiritual are inadequate translations to help us understand the nature of what Paul's trying to say in Greek. And that's right. Paul's larger point is that different creatures have different kinds of bodies. So that the heavenly bodies, which remember are considered spiritual beings in the biblical worldview, are a kind of body that is similar, but also different from the bodies of earthly creatures. So the spiritual beings have a certain type of body, and we have a certain type of body. Just like the stars is a type of body. What is it? It's gaseous, right? It's not the same as, as the rock of a planet, for example. This helps Paul's larger point that the resurrection body of Yahshua is still a body, but of a different kind. In 1543, and here's the, the really fun part, in 1543 to 44, Paul contrasts a natural, and the Greek word there is sukikon, a natural body with a spiritual, and the word there is pneumatikon body. The problem is that in English, the contrast pair natural and spiritual sounds like a contrast between physical material and for the natural and non-material spiritual. Uh, I want to I want to just uh, give you a bit of a caveat that that Tim Mackey here goes into an explanation that to me it sounds fairly plausible, but there's a simpler explanation to the Greek here and what he's trying to say, which I'll explain to you in a minute. But let's go through what Tim Mackey says because it's rather interesting and and uh, and and I think it makes sense as well. So he says. So the problem is that in English, the contrast pair. So, okay, what is he talking about? So 43, 44, let me show you in a translation that uh, that's more common for us. So let's look at, let's look at the NIV, for example. Uh, you know what? Let's stick with NASB because this is just more strict uh, a translation. So 1 Corinthians 15, 43. Okay, so he says, uh, it is sown, the body, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, and then look in the lower left, uh, low there, it's uh, actually in the bottom, the middle, sukikon. And then the translation that they have there is natural, unspiritual. Let's so note that. And then it is raised a spiritual body, and then the word is, it, there is pneumatikon. So, um, uh, which is uh, translated there as uh, spiritual. Okay. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. Okay. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. All right. So let's go back to Mackie. And he says, in 1543 to 44, 
Paul contrasts a natural Sukikon body with the spiritual pneumaticon body. The problem is that in English, the contrast pair natural and spiritual sounds like a contrast between physical material, uh, Sukikon, and non-material, spiritual, pneumaticon. This has led some readers to read this paragraph, which in 1545 describes the risen Yahshua as a life-giving spirit, to conclude that Paul believes that the resurrection body is non-physical, that is, a disembodied reality, which I just proved to you is not, right? Because he ate with them. They could touch him. They can grab his feet. They can touch his side. So he's right. This is not what Paul is saying. Paul used the words natural and spiritual earlier in this same letter, and these parallel examples are important to understand what Paul means by these same words in chapter 15. A, notice that we find the same contrast between natural and spiritual, but we have lots of other additional terms that fill out the portrait of each. So let me read what he's reading from the earlier part of 1 Corinthians, uh, which is 1 Corinthians 2, 12 to 3, 3. Okay, so now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from Elohim, so that we may know the things freely given to us by Elohim, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. So he's saying that uh, we don't have the spirit of the world, but the spirit that comes from Elohim, and that's what, that's what allows us to understand spiritual things, because we're not, you know, we have this secular way of thinking that cannot understand the things of Elohim, but when you are you are connected with the spirit of Yahweh, the spirit gives you an understanding of spiritual things. Otherwise, you can't really understand them. This is why the world sometimes is clueless about what we mean by certain things that are spiritual. So, but a natural sukikos, and there's that word again, a natural human, I just use the term secular to describe that person, right? But a natural human, in other words, a human that is not what? Motivated by the spirit. But they're motivated by the earthly way of thinking, right? But a natural human does not accept the things of the spirit of Elohim for their foolishness to him. They're like clueless because they don't, they don't have the same mind. It's like trying to understand. It's, it's not exactly the same analogy, but it's, it's, it's sort of analogous to not having the right, the, the right. It's like the Rosetta Stone, right? If, if the Rosetta Stone was used to decipher or decode one language into another. Without the key, it's like a key. Without the key, you can't understand what's being said. Well, it's sort of like that. Not exactly. But it's the idea that the spirit of Yahweh is the key to understanding spiritual things. But a natural-minded, in other words, that person is motivated, animated, if you will. That person is motivated by by an earthly way of thinking. That earthly way of thinking does not accept the things of the spirit of Elohim for their foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. So you're trying to understand something spiritual with a secular mind, is what he's saying. But he who is spiritual, that's you, that's me, appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. In other words, we kind of have an edge because we can understand the spiritual things. It's like watching the newscast and seeing, wow, this, this is prophecy being fulfilled right before our eyes. A person who is motivated just by the natural doesn't see that, right? Because all they see is a news report, and this is happening, and this is happening, and okay, so what? But we look at stuff and we say, wow, the scripture says this, there it is. The scripture says this, there it is. For who has known the mind of Yahweh that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Messiah. So that's why we're able to be ambassadors, because we, because we have the upper hand, right? I don't say that with some big measure of, of worldly pride, but we, we always think we're the tail. That's the frustrating thing to me. We think we're the tail, and we're not. We're not the tail. We're the head. We shouldn't be allowing worldly people to explain what social justice is. We're the purveyors of social justice. We shouldn't be allowing worldly people to dictate what justice is and what what righteousness is. And you know, and we're the ones who are supposed to be at the forefront of that. And I, brothers and sisters, cannot speak to you as to spiritual humans, but as to humans of the flesh etc. Right? And I couldn't speak to you because you were not ready for it. And he describes how you still had to show jealousy and strife. In other words, you showed all the fruit of the, of, the, of the flesh and not of the spirit, you see. 
And are you not walking like mere humans? In other words, humans with the old earthly nature? So he's using this as sort of a help to understand when we use the same terms later, like sukikas, what he's talking about. Everyone follow me so far? All right. So A, notice that we find the same contrast between natural and spiritual, but we have lots of other additional terms that fill out the portrait of each. Natural equals foolish and human, and fleshly equals jealousy and strife, right? That's down here. Spiritual equals from Yahweh and wise and mature. In other words, Paul's main contrast in using the words natural and spiritual is not between physical and non-physical. That's not what's being conveyed here. In this context, he's addressing how there are some Corinthians who have turned the assembly into a popularity contest aimed at increasing the honor and status of celebrity leaders. That was, in fact, happening. This is what he calls natural and fleshly because it leads to jealousy and strife. In other words, they're, they're prioritizing the wrong things. They're ruled by the natural way of thinking instead of by the spiritual way of thinking. For Paul, spiritual refers to a mode of humanity that is empowered by Yahweh's life-giving spirit, creating love, peace, in other words, the fruit of the spirit, creating love, peace, and generosity in the world. These are acts that are very much physical, but they exist in a different kind of way than mere human behavior. In other words, than secular behavior. We're still human beings, but we're not motivated by the human way of thinking. We're motivated or animated, if you will, empowered, if you will, by the spirit. That's what's driving us. That's what's moving us, you see. And that's why we're a new humanity, because we are driven by a different spirit than the secular spirit of this world. Okay, we're gonna keep, I'm going to keep on reading what he says about this here, because he, he has more to say about it. But I want to just shift over for a minute over to the writings of N.T. Wright, because I think that this will help you a little bit as well. And this, like I said, this is a bit more of a, uh, of a, of a, of a simpler explanation, right? It's, it's the idea of something being animated by the spirit. You heard, you've heard me use that term several times. So this is from uh, a simple, uh, he has very complicated ones, but this is a simple commentary by N.T. Wright. Uh, it's, from, it's from a commentary known as the, uh, the, the New Testament for everyone. So uh, when I go down to verse 43, uh, 44, excuse me, it is sown as the embodiment, the body of ordinary nature, this is NT's translation, and raised as the embodiment of the spirit. If ordinary nature has its embodiment, then the spirit too has its embodiment. That's what it means when the Bible says the first man, Adam, became a living natural being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But you don't get the spirit-animated body first. You get the nature-animated one, and you get the spirit-animated one later. The first man is from the ground and is made of earth. The second man is from heaven. Earthly people are like the man of earth. Heavenly people are like the man from heaven. We have borne the image of the man made of earth. We shall also bear the image of the man from heaven. And you, we all know that N.T. Wright doesn't teach that we're in heaven or we're going to heaven, right? So he's talking about heavenly people. In other words, people who are made, uh, who are going to, who have as their source, the heavenly man as opposed to the earthly man, which is Yahshua the Messiah. So let's go down to his actual commentary. We may do, uh, but it gets us to the point, I'm over here, of this long, uh, but it gets us to the point of this long, dense, and usually important discussion. And I'm just reading straight from the text. What sort of a body will the resurrection produce and what will it run on? We may as well go to the heart of the passage to the verse that has puzzled people many times in the past and still does. In verse 44, Paul contrasts the two types of bodies, the present one and the resurrection one. The words he uses are technical and tricky. Many versions translate these words as physical body and spiritual body, but this is highly misleading. That is as though the difference between the old car and the new one was that whereas the old one was made of steel, the new one is made of something quite different plastic, say, or wood, or some as yet uninvented metal alloy. If you go that route, you may well end up saying, as many have done, that Paul is making a contrast simply between what we call a body that is a physical object and what we might call a ghost, a spiritual object. I refer to it as a disembodied spirit, right? 
in the sense of non-physical, but that is exactly what he is not saying. The contrast he's making is between a body animated by one type of life and a body animated by another type. So he's not even explaining it in terms of what Tim Mackey's doing. Uh, hold on a second. So he's not saying explaining it in in, in uh, ways that Tim Mackey was doing in the sense of being even being driven by a by a philosophy, right? And philosophy may be the wrong word, but a way of thinking, right? Mackey is talking about uh, you know a, a a an earthbound way of thinking, a secular way of thinking, as a as opposed to a spiritual way of thinking. I still think that makes total sense. But I think that the simpler explanation is the more accurate explanation, which is just the Greek explanation, the, the, the explanation of language. So he says the contrast he's making is between a body animated by one type of life and a body animated by another type. The difference between them is found, if you like, in what the two bodies, not what they're made of, in what the two bodies run on. The present body is animated by the normal life which all humans share. This is why the reason why I say that I believe that this is the accurate explanation is because what does he say? Let me just let me just leave the these words here and go to the translation again. He he goes on to talk about uh, Adam, right? So it, he says verse forty five. So also it is written, the first man Adam became a living soul, and this is something that causes a lot of people confusion as well. What is that word soul? Look in the bottom. Word is suke, right? Which is Sukikan, a natural body. So what happened was that when the breath of life was given to Adam, it says in Genesis that Yahweh breathed his nishama. His nishama is that, that breath of life. And when he breathed the breath of life into this clay, so to speak, or this earth, Adam became a living soul. It doesn't say that Adam got a soul. The nishama is not some disembodied soul that was put in Adam. The Nishama was the breath of life. And what happened was that that breath of life animated Adam. That breath of life made him walk and talk and do all the things that I'm doing right now. If that breath of life is pulled for me right now, if all of a sudden, Father forbid, that I should drop that on the spot here in the middle of this lecture, I would be as a piece of flesh, totally disanimated, right? Because the Nishama would leave me. That nishama is not the spirit of Yahweh, you must understand. That's not the same thing as the spirit of Yahweh that, is, that, is, that, that comes upon us. It's the breath of life, the nishama. The nishama, together with my body, is what makes me a living soul. I am a soul. Praise Yahweh, oh my soul. Not praise Yahweh, this one little separate thing. I'm, I'm kind of giving you a study about the soul today too, right? It's, it's, it's not praise Yahweh, oh this element of me that's a soul that's part from my body. No, it's what about me, all of me. I am a soul. Praise Yahweh, all my soul. It's a poetic way of saying, praise Yahweh with all my being, all my life, right? Adam became a living soul when that neshama was given to him. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit, right? So what happened, and that word spirit is pneuma, pneumaticon, right? So the first Adam is, is one who, who had to be breathed into by the author of life in order for him to live. The last Adam, Yashra himself, he, he became a life-giving spirit. He is, he is one that actually gives the life. He's superior to Adam in every way, you understand, you see. So it's, it's a question of animation. What is animating the spirit, uh, the, animating the body? Well, the first body was animated by the nishama, but it was, it was based upon a, na a natural process. The second process is eternal. Because it's not based upon a natural process. It's based upon a life-giving spirit that is the spirit of Yahshua, you see. There's a much different situation, much different scenario. So let's go back to, um, let's go back to the, um, the text here. Back to N.T. Uh, in his commentary. So the present body is animated by the normal life which all humans share. The word Paul uses for this often means soul, that's suke. He means it in the sense of the ordinary life force on which we all depend in this present body, the ordinary energy that keeps us breathing and our blood circulating. But the body that we shall be given in the resurrection is to be animated by Yahweh's own spirit. This is what Paul says in a simpler passage, Romans 8, 10 to 11. 
what is Romans 8, 10 to 11? Well, let's take a quick look at that because that also has to do with this. And by the way, this all has to do with the new humanity because it's talking about what we're going to be like in the future, right? So just bear with me as I find that for you. Uh, Romans 8, 10. I hope this stuff blows your mind like it blows my mind. Okay, Romans 8, 10. And I'll bring that up. If Messiah is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Yahshua from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Messiah Yahshua from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That's it right there. What is that spirit? Look at the bottom there. To, uh, penuma, uh, penu, penumatos. That's penuma, pneumaticon, animated by the spirit. So this is not just the neshama anymore, right? Just the breath of life, which is a natural process, the breath of life combined with the mortal flesh. Now we're talking about the very spirit of Yahweh, his penuma, the penuma hagion, the Holy Spirit, his penuma, which is now what is going to animate our spiritual body, right? This is why when you look at Ephesians and you see that it's talking about an Arabon, the Arabon, the down payment of what? The down payment of the Holy Spirit which is the breath of life, or not the breath of life, which is the actual spirit, it's a down payment for the future of all humanity, which is animated by the spirit of Yahweh. You see that? And you see that in several places where it's the spirit of Yahweh itself. So when Yahweh breathes his spirit on Pentecost day, it's a, it's a, it's a, a preview of the entire new humanity. It's a reversal of the curse of Eden. It's a reversal of the curse of Babylon. It's a it's 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 a it's a a, a preview of is Joel two right where the spirit is poured upon all flesh. You see, okay. Let's go back to. Um, uh, I want to finish up NT, so bear with me. The word Paul uses for this often means soul, suke. He means it in the sense of the ordinary. Okay, but the body that shall be given in the resurrection is to be animated by Yahweh's own spirit. This is what Paul says in a simpler passage, Romans 8, 10 to 11. The spirit of Yahshua the Messiah dwells within you at the moment, and Elohim will give life to your mortal bodies through this spirit who lives inside you. This is why it's so important, the giving of the Holy Spirit, because this is going to be that spirit that animates you for, for eternity. But when the spirit creates a new body, it won't wear out. Here, in order to make the illustration of the new car really work, he would have to say that the new fuel will not only preserve the engine forever, but the body work too. That would be straining even fantasy imagination a bit far. But we need to say something like that to do justice to what Paul has written here. Okay, and then it, it goes on to describe in greater detail what, uh, what, uh, what he's saying. So just to kind of wrap that up, and then I'll get back to... Um, uh, to uh, uh, the Bible project. It's like, uh, it's, it's so this idea of, 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 of Sukikon and Pneumaticon is it's like, instead of saying that you have a, a sailboat and a tugboat, it's not that. It's you have a sailboat and a sailboat, except the sailboat is powered by wind or the sailboat is powered by an engine. It's like that. It's the latter that, that those terms are referring to. Okay, so I spent a lot of time going through that because I really want you to understand that so that you don't get confused when people look at that and, and tell you something else. All right, let's go back to uh, Bible Project. When we apply four, when we apply these conclusions, we're almost done. When we apply these conclusions to the contrast between the Genesis 1 human as natural and earthy in contrast to the risen Yahshua who is heavenly and a life-giving spirit, Paul is not saying that the resurrected Yahshua is not physical, just the opposite. He is saying that the risen Yahshua exists as a new kind of humanity, that's exactly right, whose origins, values, and nature are not determined by the physical constraints of creation as we currently experience it. And he bears that out in the New Testament, that the record of Yahshua in his new body is, is showing something completely different. The risen Yahshua is the first prototype of a spirit-empowered humanity whose life can be given to others through the power and presence of Yahweh's spirit. Hallelujah. When Genesis 2 speaks of the creator making Adam as a living being, Greek Septuagint, Sike or Suke, this was not 
a secondary form of humanity, but its primary form, the natural king first. What humans now need is not to get away from or back behind such an existence. And, and this is key, right? Which is why the body is still partly physical, because there's no need to throw the whole body out. It's just that the way that it rolled out because of sin, it, it, it never reached its fruition. The point is not to throw out the physical completely. The point is to make the physical what it was always intended to be, you see, from the very beginning. What humans now need is not to get away from or back behind such an existence, but rather to go on to the promised state of the final atom, to make it whole again, to make it entire, yes in which this physical body will not be abandoned, but will be given new animation by the creator's own spirit. Paul does not believe in a return to the primal state, but in the redemption, see, because man cannot inherit flesh and blood, or rather flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom, right? Okay, we see that on, on the right. But in the redemption from the sin and death, which has corrupted the primal state, in order that a way forward be found into the new creation, which though always in the mind of the creator had never yet existed. The man from heaven is not a being who, unsullied by the world of creation, remains in a purely non-physical state. He is the risen sovereign who will come from the heavenly realm, 1 Corinthians 15, 47 to 49. He will enable other humans <coughs> not to escape from the physical world, but to go on to bear in the new resurrected body the image of the human from heaven. And that's a quote, that entire last quote there is taken straight from N.T. Wright, the resurrection of the son of Elohim. Let me read you 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 57. Now I say this, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Elohim. Why? Because it's purely earthy. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment. In a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we will be changed. For this perishable, the tent, must put on the imperishable, the building, the house. And this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to Elohim, who gives us the victory through our sovereign Yahshua Messiah. Five. With the contrast between the new and old humanity in place, Paul concludes the entire line of thought with his hope of a transformation of our mortal bodies into a new creation existence, the immortal state that humanity forfeited in Genesis 3. In Paul's mind, the future resurrection of the new humanity is the grand fulfillment of the storyline of Genesis 1-2. to In other words, we come full circle, right? Or full rectangle, right? If you go from the Yashua story to the Israel story to the cosmic story, and mankind is made whole. Lastly, the new humanity and the new creation. In the final book of the Bible, John the visionary depicts the new creation as a new Jerusalem Eden temple, which recalls Genesis 1 to 2, but also carries it further into new territory. And I'm going to read these passages, and then we'll read his notes. This is uh, Revelation 21, 1 to 3. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from Elohim. And remember, this is metaphorical language, right? Maybe this, is, this is more of a dimensional thing than an up and down type of thing. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from Elohim made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the tabernacle of Elohim is among men, right? This is John 1, that he tabernacled among us. The tabernacle of Elohim is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and Elohim himself will be among them. Let me, let me just pause here for a minute, and I want to take you also to yeah, uh, Ezekiel 37 verse 24. So, you know, the beginning of Ezekiel 37 is the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones. And um, a lot of people interpret that as the resurrection. It may be an allusion to the resurrection, but it's that's actually more metaphorical language about the restoration of Israel. But Ezekiel 34, excuse me, 37, 24, my servant David, 
will be king over them. Who is my servant David? Is this, is this referring to a resurrected King David, or is it referring to Yahshua? It's not entirely clear, but it, it, it seems to me that it's that's actually Yahshua. My servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd, and they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. They will live on the land that I gave to Jacob, my servant, in, who, in which your fathers lived, and they will live on it they and their sons and their sons' sons forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them. And I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place also, my mishkan, that's the tabernacle. My dwelling place also will be with them. And I will be their Elohim. And they will be my people. And the nations will know that I am Yahweh who sanctifies Israel. When my sanctuary, my mikdash, when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. So this is John 1 language. This is Ezekiel 37 language. The, tem the tabernacle is with them forever, you see. Okay, let's go back. Behold, the tabernacle of Elohim is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and Elohim himself will be among them. And then Revelation 22, the last chapter of the Bible, 1 to 5, then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of Elohim and of the Lamb in the middle of its street, on either side of the river was the tree of life. We're back in Eden. We're back to the tree of life. But now we can eat of it freely, right? Because now the redemption has come, and this is eternity. On either side of the river was a tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse. So whatever curse there was, as a result of the fall, is gone. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of Elohim and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And they will, there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because Yahweh Elohim will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. And that's Daniel language, it's Ezekiel language, etc. And it's Genesis language. They will reign forever and ever. It's Psalm 8 language, right? It's what man was supposed to do from the very beginning. In the final book of the Bible, John the Visionary depicts the new creation as a new Jerusalem, Eden, temple. All the same. New Jerusalem, Eden, temple. And you can add tabernacle in there as well. It's all the same image. It's all the center of the garden, which recalls Genesis 1-2, to 2, but also carries it further into new territory. A, this new creation is simultaneously a new heavens and earth, recalling Genesis 1-1, a new Jerusalem, recalling Isaiah 60 and 65, a new temple, recalling Exodus 25 to 31 and 35 to 40, and a new garden of Eden, recalling Genesis 2, all at the same time. John is combining images of the new Eden from all over the Hebrew scriptures because he takes them as referring to one ultimate reality. That's absolutely right. And Paul understood all these things, and he was explaining Yahshua in that light. Notice the final line of the scene in 22.5, and they will reign forever and ever. This clearly recalls the original human vocation. The vocation is restored. The original human vocation from Genesis 1, 26 to 28, that humanity, as the image of Elohim, reigns as Yahweh's partners and children forever in creation. Let us create man in our image in our likeness, and let man rule over the beasts of the field, etc., etc., right? Once all of creation joins Yahshua and the new humanity in the resurrection, Yahweh's ultimate purposes for creation will be fulfilled. This is all possible in and through the eternal human partner who loved us and gave himself for us so that his eternal life could become our own. And then you see several uh, bibli bibliographical entries if you want to look a little deeper into some of this. Wow, we got through it. That was that was six six long parts, but we got through it. So I hope that that was a useful study. I hope that it gave you some perspective. I hope that it it, it gave you um, some encouragement about what our vocation is and what our ultimate end and destiny is. You know, whatever happens to us, and I'm going to be a little bit melodramatic here, if you'll if you'll if you'll uh, indulge me. You know, whatever happens to any of us here till, till, till the end of our lives, no one can ever take that understanding away from us, right? No matter what happens to us, that we understand why we're here. We understand if we want to accept it, that's up to us, right? But we, we 
no matter who you are, no matter what your station in, in life, according to other people or whatever, please know that this is your vocation and this is your end to be co-rulers with Yahweh in a restored Eden. And no one can ever take that away from you, no matter what. So may Yahweh be praised. And, um, and I'll leave it at that.